Uh, right then, brethren, uh, last week uh, I said we'd look at Psalms 90 and Psalms 91 over a couple of weeks or so. And so last week we did Psalm number 90. This week, of course, that means we're moving on to Psalm 91. Now, in Psalm 90, which we've uh, finished now, uh, just as a quick reminder, we did see that one of the takeaways, one of the key takeaways from Psalm 90 is, although it refers in that psalm to the um, so-called biblical three-score years and ten, right? we hopefully saw that was not God's design for all mankind to be limited to three-score years and ten or seventy or at a push maybe eighty, that was actually a curse on the particular generation of Israel who were following Moses around the wilderness for 40 years. They were cursed with a time limit of essentially three score years and ten. We also saw last week uh, that there's another often misquoted scripture, Hebrews 9.27. We're not turning there, but that's one that people often use to say, oh, you know, there is an appointed time for us to die. And once you reach that time, boom, you're dead. Well, no, you aren't. That scripture does not say there is an appointed time at which you will die. It says simply that you're appointed to die. And scriptures showed us that there are ways you can shorten your life. There are ways you can extend and lengthen your life. So that was last week. Now on to Psalms number 91. And Psalms 91 is a very popular a psalm, um, I guess Psalm 23, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, is also very popular. But Psalm 91 is perhaps the next most popular, uh, especially uh, popular among military men and uh, women. It's often referred to as the psalm of protection or the soldier's psalm. And we'll see why as we go through it. Uh, there are a number of uh, military uh, men and women who carry little cards in their jacket pockets with Psalm 91 printed on them. In fact, I think we've got some of those cards in our house. And some of these soldiers, military men, women, I guess nowadays, they read the psalm every day. Uh, some of them memorize the psalm. They have excerpts um, engraved on their dog tags and so on. It's a very popular psalm with the military. And there are even anecdotal stories, in other words, there are stories, but you can't quite, you know, get hard evidence. But there are anecdotal stories of some men, some entire companies, uh, who used to come through battles completely unscathed. Because they were people who read and quoted Psalms 91 every day. And some of the other companies around them, same battles, very large numbers of casualties. Now, that may or may not be true. But one way or another, Psalms 91 is certainly an interesting and quite a thought-provoking psalm. So let's turn to Psalm number 91. And you better leave your marker there or your five ten dollars bill. So we'll be flipping, flipping backwards and forwards and back to Psalm 91 quite a lot. And as we begin, we'll probably notice that there appears to be three parties involved in Psalm 91. There is a more experienced person giving advice to a younger person, like a teacher to a student. So those two parties. And then at the end of the psalm, God steps in and God makes a few statements to the parties. So we've got these, you know, three persons and we'll see how that sort of swaps around from verse to verse. So let's read verses one through eight just to get a, a bit of a feel for, for the psalm, Psalm 91, verses 1 through 8. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, or Jehovah, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler, the hunter, and from the perilous pestilence, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler, buckler being a small shield. 
you shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence, the disease that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Well, wow, that's quite encouraging straight off. That's, uh, you know, quite an interesting psalm. You can see lots of references there to to being secure, to a place of refuge, to protection, to God's wings hovering over you, not being afraid even though there's a thousand dying at one side and ten thousand another. No pestilence or disease will come near you. That's all pretty exciting stuff. Uh, And it is, and that's the theme of the psalm. That's why it's called the psalm of protection. That's his theme. But all of what we just read there really is contingent on verse 1. Without verse 1, you don't get the rest. So look at verse 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow or protection of the Almighty. This only applies to he or she who dwells in the secret place of the Almighty. So all the protection that we read about there it doesn't come automatically. You don't just get protected because, well, I know about the Sabbath and I know about the feast days and uh, I know about the millennium, therefore I'll be protected. It doesn't say that. Verse 1 says, he who dwells in a particular place is the one who will enjoy this protection. And you know what it means to dwell in a place, don't you? To to dwell means to reside, uh, to settle down. To make your home somewhere, you know, currently I dwell in uh, Milton Keynes, uh, a town in so England. Nice, That's where I dwell. That's where I reside. This is where you'll find me <laughs> in Milton Keynes. You won't find me typically in Aberdeen or Glasgow or San Francisco. Uh, I'm in Milton Keynes. That's where I dwell. And here's a person who dwells somewhere. They reside somewhere in the secret place of the Almighty. So this person is not um, a occasional visitor to God. Hey, God, it's me. I know we haven't seen each other for a while, but I've got this emergency. So you don't go knocking on God's door, you know, once in a blue moon. Uh, we're talking here of somebody who dwells, abides under God's shadow. And of course, you know, shadow is actually quite an important place you could be. I mean, most of us, you know, live in nice homes. Some of us might have air conditioning. Our cars might be air conditioned. But if you're in a hot climate, you know, blazing sun, high temperatures, shadow, oh, wonderful. Get into the shadows, a lot cooler and much more pleasant. Um, a shadow under the shadow of the Almighty is a good place to be. Uh, the net translation of verse 1 says, uh, the one who lives in the shelter of the Sovereign One and resides in the protective shadow of the Mighty King. So we're talking here about somebody who has a very close relationship, who's actually living, dwelling in a place or position with their God, with the Almighty. They're not estranged. They're not living in another world. They've chosen to camp uh, with the Creator God. And this is quite a common theme, uh, not to you and me perhaps, I'm not sure this is language that we use or pictures uh, that, that we actually see very often, but to the psalmists, to the men and women of God back then, they had this this view of being in God's secret place, God being their refuge, their hiding place. Let's look at, uh, keep your place there of course, keep your place there till the end of the message, But let's turn now to Psalms 27. Psalms 27. And we'll read verses uh, 1 to 5. Psalms 27. Psalm of David. Who writes, uh, The Lord, or Jehovah, is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
which actually, if you think about it, is quite a good question. If, if Jehovah God is our God, and we're close to him, who on earth would we fear? First, carrying on, the Lord Jehovah is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. The one army should encamp against me. My heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this I will be confident. Similar language to Psalms 91 and the thousand at one side and ten thousand at the other side and so on. Verse 4. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. So here's the same sort of language as Psalms 91. The psalmist sees God as a place of refuge, a place particularly in time of trouble. It says in verse 5, in the time of trouble. And some people think these verses are even uh, prophetic about you know the end of time, uh, the tribulation period. That'll be a time of considerable trouble. And I think all of us would like to be hidden at that time, but that's prophecy. This is more general. Verse 5, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. Pavilion is used elsewhere in the Old Testament as uh, for like a lion's den, like a den, a hiding place. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Is this a picture that, that we have, that God is a hiding place, a, a den, a secret place where we're protected? Look at verses 7 through 10. Hear, O Jehovah, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face, Lord, I will seek. And of course, to seek somebody's face is to seek a very close relationship. You're going to see somebody face to face. That means you're in front of them, right? You can't speak to somebody face to face over the telephone. Um, or a different country, I can't see you face to face. I mean, with, of course, the miracles of TV and so on, it, it can be done. You know, modern day cameras and videos, but this is talking about seeing God face to face. That's that's up close, right? Uh, do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me, nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and mother forsake me, were that to happen, then the Lord will take care of me. So it becomes evident when you read lots of the Psalms, and we're going to look at a few today, that all the Psalmists had this um, very clear picture in their mind that God is there for them. He's on their side. Uh, he's close. They can hide under his shadow. They can hide in his secret place. They can put all their trust uh, in him. Look at Psalms 31. Psalms 31. Let's read verses uh, 14 and 15. But as for me, I trust in you, O Jehovah. I say, you are my God. And he says that. I guess he says it out loud. Something he confesses with his mouth. You are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let's read verses 19 and 20. Oh, how great is your goodness, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you, in the presence of the sons of men. There might be men all around, but this psalmist chooses to trust in God. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence from the plots of men, you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion, in a den, from the strife of tongues. So this psalmist, I think it's the same one again, it's David again, is talking about a secret place in God's presence, being hidden from the plots of enemies, 
being kept secretly in a pavilion or or a or a, a den, uh, a hiding place, and for that reason the psalmist you know trusts God. Look at Psalms thirty two, the next psalm, Psalms thirty two, verses six through eleven. For this cause everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not come near him. Of course, great waters can be a metaphor for all manner of troubles and assaults and uh, some people um, being overcome and going under. It's language that we all use. But surely in a great flood of waters they won't come near this person. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble. You shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. Think on that. And the psalmist sees God as his hiding place. Trusts in God. uh, Whose face, you know, he or she seeks. I will instruct you and teach you, says God. This is God speaking now. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. That sounds pretty good. That God would see better than we can see what's down the road and round the corner and uh, guide us with his uh, insights and vision. Do not be like the horse or like the mule, a stubborn donkey which have no understanding, which must be harnessed with bit and bridle, else he will not come near you. Uh, you We shouldn't be like that with God where he, you know, just can't get us to respond. Um, you know, verse 10 and 11. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked, but he who trusts in Jehovah, mercy shall surround him. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. That sounds like good advice. And uh, we all want God, I think, to guide us on our way and to be our protector. But we need to see him as that. Otherwise, you know, we miss the picture of what the psalmists were trying to paint. You know, it's quite clear that many of the psalmists understood that it was good to run to God in times of trouble. To, to see God as your refuge, as your den, as your secret place. And ideally... According to Psalm 91 and a couple of others, a good place to live, the place to dwell, not just be a, you know, occasional visitor. And and whether we visit God from time to time or whether we dwell in his secret place and his refuge is really a matter of choice. Our choice is a decision we make. And what do you think? Does the world dwell in the secret place of God? Well, you know they don't. How about the church? Does the church, do church members dwell, dwell, abide in the secret place of the Most High God? Do you? Well, the answer is, of course, that uh, some church members and men and women of God do. And I would imagine quite a few are occasional visitors. In which case the protection doesn't really apply. And we can see the church is not perfect there. If we look at a couple of places in Revelation, look at Revelation chapter 2. Let's read verses 1 and 4. So Revelation chapter 2. We've got Jesus' letter to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. We're all I think fairly familiar with it, particularly the bit that refers to us, the Philadelphians, of course. Uh, Not those nasty lot over there, the nasty Laodiceans. But here is uh, Revelation 2, verses 1 and 4. We're just talking about, you know, do church members automatically live in this place of refuge, this place of safety? Do they see God's face? Is that where you find church members, by and large? Well, certainly not all of them. Uh, chapter 2, verses 1 and 4. To the angel of the church uh, in Ephesus, write, verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. So here's uh, an entire era. If we go with the understanding of eras, 
otherwise it's the entire church in Ephesus has left their first love. They've left God. That's hardly abiding and dwelling in the secret den of the Most High God if you've left him. <laughs> right? You've left your first love. He's over there and you're over somewhere else. You're not dwelling together, are you? Not if you've left, you aren't. And of course, Jesus says, you know, repent and sort yourselves out. That's not a great place to be. How are you going to be protected if you've left your first love? All of Psalm 91 is about the man who dwells and abides in the shadow of, all right? Look at Revelation 3. Let's look at that nasty lot. Where we, of course, are not to be found. Oh, no. Only yeah. others. <clears throat> Revelation 3, uh, verse 14, just gives us the, the heading. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, uh, right? Let's read now verses 16 through 20. So here's what Jesus has to say to the Laodicean brethren. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, well, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, presumably you don't even need God any longer, and don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Obviously, they, in a sense, they could see, but not, not clearly. They misunderstood their position entirely. They may have felt or considered that they deserved God's protection. Maybe some of them thought they already dwelt in God's secret place. But certainly, from the perspective of Jesus Christ, they were a disgusting bunch. Uh, and distasteful to the point where he would, you know, the language would puke them out of his mouth. Verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, and here's the giveaway. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. So are they dwelling together? No. Because Jesus is on the outside of the door. He wants to dwell with them. He wants them to dwell with him. He says, I'm at the door knocking. Knock, knock, knock. Knock, knock, knock. Anybody in there? Knock, knock, knock. Do you want to open up? Knock, knock, knock. But clearly, you're not dwelling in the secret place of the Most High if he's outside the door of wherever you happen to be. So here's another you know, example of church people. Um, who are not dwelling with the Lord Jesus. Uh, it seems Jesus is very keen to dwell with them. Uh, I guess he does not want to spew them out of his mouth, but he knows that's inevitable unless they repent and wake up. So he continues to knock on the door to let him in so he may dine with them, sup with them, and see them face to face. And they may dwell together. So, you know, Ephesus could choose to leave their first love. They could choose to return. The Laodiceans could choose to let Jesus in and seek his face. Or they could choose to be complacent. And you and I can choose as well. Okay, let's go back to Psalms 91. Hopefully you've kept your place there. And let's read verse 2 again. Verse 2, the psalmist says, I will say of Jehovah, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. So here's uh, what you'd have to class as as a authentic confession. I will say. So here's something the psalmist says. He says that I imagine out loud, it's a statement, it's a you know, vocal statement of his belief. I will save the Lord. He's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God. He's my guardian. He's my protector. I trust in him. Now, I guess, you know, more often people like you and me 
Uh, we often happily believe in our hearts, quietly. Uh, but this verse suggests that this man or woman of God uh, speaks up. They speak words of faith and confidence. Um, and of course, if you speak, then we, we ourselves hear. But if you speak something, well, Satan hears as well, doesn't he? If you speak something, uh, the angels hear if you speak something. But I guess the question we could all ask ourselves, looking at verse 2, is how often do we speak out our faith? I know that we'd all claim to have faith of some sort, a little bit, modest amount, a bit more, hoping to have more one of these days yes, when I'm down the road and round the corner. But the question here really is, the psalmist who enjoys this protection speaks. He says, I will say of the Lord, he's my God. So in practice, do we do that? And do we do what the psalmist says? Put our trust in God? It says it, look, he's my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my place of safety I trust in him so I guess do we do that or do we have a tendency to rely on others for our help do we look to other people for help or do we primarily see God as our refuge and our source because if we look to people whoever they might be is that really wise given that we could look to God and say, God's my refuge and my help? Or do we look to people? The latter is probably a mistake. Let's look at Psalms 146 and read verses 3 through 7. Psalms 146. I used to work with a guy for many years and... I think I only knew about two scriptures, <laughs> and this was one of them. He was forever quoting uh, verse 3. Uh, I think King James, I think, says, put not your trust in princes. You know, and He was always on about being disappointed by people we worked with, people you relied upon and work, who said they're going to do certain things, they're going to be there for you, uh, they're going to look after your interests, and so often it never took place. And you'd often hear this coming from the guy whose name was Jim. You'd often hear him saying, put not your trust in princes, the Bible says. I think it's about the only verse he, he, he knew, perhaps one other one. But verse 3, um, do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. But that's, that's good advice from the psalmist. Don't put your trust in people. Because one reason, verse 4 his spirit departs, he returns to his earth, and that very day his plans or thoughts perish. They die. The very best of men or women in whom you might put your trust will die on you at some point. And of course, human nature being what it is, very often they'll just desert you. You know, so it's not wise to put our trust in, in men or princes. I mean, princes you think would be the, the better of the men, people of nobility, right? Today you might say, put not your trust in politicians. Well, I'm not sure we would anyway. Put not your trust in bank managers. Put not your trust in world's leaders. Put not your trust necessarily in evangelists, ministers. Just be careful, right? But verse 5 tells us, Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in Jehovah, his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever. He's reliable, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Jehovah gives freedom to the prisoners. Now that's a place to have your faith and confidence. And that's what the psalmist says. I will save the Lord of Jehovah. He's my refuge. He's my God. And you and I really ought to be thinking the same way. Now, I understand that humanly we can get a bit of help here and there 
family, friends, and so on. You can do a little bit. It's not impossible. We often try to help others and vice versa. But it's so limited because ultimately somebody you might be depending on can die before whatever they promised even came to pass. But the man or woman who has a Psalm 91 attitude, they know where to put their trust. Look at uh, Psalms 71, verses 1 through 3. Psalms 71. Verses 1 through 3. In you, O Jehovah, I put my trust. Oh, that's it. And I guess if we had that one verse hovering in front of our eyes all day long. In you, O Jehovah, I put my trust. You my trust, Jehovah, Jehovah God. You my trust. I'll say of you, you're my trust. That's what I'm saying. You're my trust. I put my trust in you, Jehovah. I guess we'd have to say it quite a lot to overcome you know, years of neglect. But that's what the psalmists seem to have in their mind. In you, O Jehovah, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong habitation. My margin says rock of habitation or refuge. Be my strong habitation to which I may resort continually. You have given the commandment to save me for you are my rock and my fortress. That, the language is pretty uh, practical, concrete. It's not all wishy-washy stuff. You know, you're my rock, you're my fortress, you're my refuge. You're my hiding place. You're my secret place. You're my shadow place. You know, the Amplified translation says in verse 3 here, Be my rock of refuge in which to dwell. Spiritually, we should be dwelling in a rock of refuge. The uh, CE, that's the contemporary English version, I think, says, Be my mighty rock, the place where I can always run for protection. So the psalmists seem to have this quite clear picture of protection being available for those who run to the rock of refuge, who dwell there. Let's go back to Psalms 91 and continue that theme. Psalms 91 verses 3 through 6. So here's the psalmist, male or female. And beginning in verse 3 through through 6, uh, surely, so this is, sounds like it's the experienced party speaking to the uh, the less experienced, or maybe it's the mentor, you know, to the, to the student. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. Well, a fowler was a, a hunter of birds, right? Well, we can, I think, uh, see this as being very much um, spiritual protection as well as physical protection <clears throat> because we're not going to get you know bird trappers after us. But there is uh, an enemy out there, an adversary out there who goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So he's in the nature of a fowler. It's a foul being, that's for sure. But God shall deliver you from the snare uh, of the adversary, the enemy. And we know he has tactics and stratagems to try and get us. But because we say of the Lord, he's my refuge, we get these benefits. So he'll deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. That's from you know, deadly diseases, deadly plagues. Uh, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. I think we see the picture there. His truth, thy word is truth, said Jesus. His truth, I guess the Bible, the scriptures, God's word, shall be your shield and buckler. That's a small shield. Well, a shield protects, right? If God's truth is a shield and a buckler, it's going to protect us if we employ it. Verse 5 
You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. And nowadays, is an obvious one. You could put in terror or terrorist, or terrorism, whichever you prefer. You shall not be afraid of the terror or terrorist by night, nor of the arrow or missile that flies by day, nor of the pestilence, disease, epidemic that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday, or of the twin towers of his what, nine o'clock in the morning? So there's a tremendous amount there of protection from adversaries, from enemies, from diseases, from plagues, from epidemics, from terrorism, right? Uh, terrorism is one that is just so evident today. You know, terrorists can strike you know, almost uh, anywhere. I guess they can strike anywhere they choose. Uh, typically, they tend to choose bigger cities, you know, London, uh, Manchester, uh, New York, places like that. And it can be, you can be attacked with bombs, guns. It can be plagues of like, you know, anthrax and smallpox. There can be nerve agents uh, used. Uh, there was an instance uh, just a couple of months ago in this country. It's a small city of uh, Salisbury where apparently, you know, Russian agents uh, painted some uh, toxic, you know, nerve compounds on, on some Russian ex-Russian home and couple there were very 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 ill so it can happen anywhere but protection is available right so it says so there's some of protection the soldier's son this protection is available it seems almost anywhere and notice verse 4 God covers you with his feathers and under his wings you take refuge that's where you hide under the wings of God under God's feathers now again that's a very common theme in scripture that God is like a mother hen protecting her chicks. I suppose people living in rural conditions and farms would probably have seen that throughout their lives. It would be a very, uh, very common illustration, perhaps for many of us that don't keep chickens and haven't been near a chicken for a while. That's a bit of a strange picture, but to the psalmists, that's how they saw God. Look at Psalm 61, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 61. This is what God designed into chickens, mother hens. That's where the idea came from. Uh, Psalm 61, verses 1 through 4. Hear my cry, O God. Attend to my prayer. From the end of the earth I will cry to you when my heart is overwhelmed. And occasionally we do feel that way. Lead me to the rock. That is higher than I, you know. Beam me up, Scotty, get me out of here. For you have been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in your tabernacle forever. I will trust in the shelter of your wings. Selah. So, you know, the psalmists certainly had this picture in their mind of a mother chicken seeing danger and giving this alarm clock 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 whatever and the wings go out and the little chickens go you know racing towards security the psalmist saw that understood it the lord jesus did also um you know he was influenced by what he saw and i guess the chicken world around him and of course he would be familiar with all these psalmists uh, pictures so let's look at matthew 23 matthew 23 and read verses 37 and 38. And I don't know if, how many of us have seen uh, chickens racing for cover. I've not seen it in real life. I've seen it on some uh, TV program somewhere in the past. So I do remember the picture. Um, but it's worth dwelling on a little bit the this is how God likens his protection to his chickens. I guess that's you and me. Verse 37 and 38, Jesus speaking, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, 
your house is left to you desolate. Uh, protection is available. The house doesn't have to be desolate, but it's going to be desolate because the little chicks don't do what they're supposed to do. You know, do you and I, you know, see God uh, often as our protector? And in fact, more than that, according to this illustration in the Bible, as a willing protector. You know, you don't have to, as I understand it, you don't have to force the mother bird to protect her chicks. Um, and any sensible chicken knows that when the alarm goes and the wings get outstretched, you run and you know where to run and hide, right? And any chick that decides it wants to be an independent chick and look after itself, don't worry, mum, I'll handle this fox on my own. That will be a dead chick. Any lesson there for you and me? Do we want to handle the situations on our own? Or might it be a good idea to be as clever as a chicken and race under mother hen's arms for protection? Now, maybe we never think of God as our protector in this way, but maybe we would if we spent more time in the Psalms. Partly what they're there for. You know, read the Psalms, uh, sing the Psalms, and think about the pictures, the illustrations, you know, the words. You know, when we looked at the first part of Psalm 91, which we've sort of done now, there appear to be at least two elements. Uh, first of all, the psalmist is aware and familiar with God's provision of protection. Are we? And secondly, the man or woman speaks it out loud. So they're aware of God's protection and they speak it out. I will say of God, he is my protector and my refuge. So it looks like you have to believe and say. And probably best, taking that as an example, if you and I did both. Believe and say. Remember, we've covered this uh, umpteen times in the past. You know, our faith has to be in two places. Our faith is in two places, not just one. It's in our hearts and in our mouths. What we believe we're supposed to say. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verses 13 and 14. So up to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verses um, 13 and 14. <clears throat> cutting somewhat into Paul's context. Verse 13, But since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he who raised up the Lord Jesus will also raise us up with Jesus and present us with you. But, but notice, the, if you like, the, the faith in two places. Or the two parts, verse 13, and it's headed here, or described here as a spirit of faith, that this is a spirit of faith. It's in two places, right? Two places. You can't just, in a sense, just believe inwardly. I believe God's my refuge, and I believe God is my protector, or maybe we don't. Maybe those thoughts and words rarely pass through our minds. I believe God's my God. And I believe um, he's my judge. And um, I believe he's my father. It's pretty good, that one. And um, But, you know, do our minds commonly, frequently, continually see God as protector, deliverer, uh, the one who will take us under his wings and protect us? But anyway, back to verse 13. The spirit of faith says, according to what is written, in the Psalms, I believed first, and therefore, subsequently, I spoke. In other words, you speak what you believe. And then Paul says, we also believe, we believe, and therefore, because we believe, we speak. Two parts. And speaking, without getting distracted today on that 
is uh-huh. is important. That's why the psalmist says in verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and strength, protector, provider, deliverer. I'll say that because I believe it. I'm saying it. And then, of course, when we believe something and say something, we have to be careful not to be um, you know, unduly swayed by what we then see around us or hear around us. Because very often what we see and hear, touch, taste, feel, whatever, uh, it's very different from what we're believing, right? But faith goes by what the Word of God says, not by what we see and hear and touch and taste. Because these things around us are all, the Scripture says, temporary. Temporary. They're temporal. Uh, Everything that you see can change. Five minutes time, an hour's time, a day's time, no matter what it is. The biggest, stronging, strongest company in America or Britain can fold up next week, for all you know. Or an earthquake can take Los Angeles away, for all we know. Uh, if you get some nasty disease, that can be healed in a millisecond. Anything that's physical is temporary. But God's truths are eternal, and we see that in the next passage, 2 Corinthians 4. Let's read verses 16 through 18. Because Paul just talked about the spirit of faith whereby we believe and then we speak. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that instantaneously the situation is now, oh, fantastic. You know, I believed and I spoke, and now one minute later everything is hunky dory and comfortable and um, back on easy street. Mm. It might not happen instantly. But Paul says, verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, and (laughs) having read some of the stuff that Paul went through, it sounds like pretty severe affliction from where I stand, my perspective. But Paul seemed to think not a lot of it. His perspective is a bit different to mine might have been. For our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, we don't look at the things you can see, but we look at the things which are not seen. What? (laughs) For the things which are seen are temporary. Subject Subject to change, in other words. But the things which are not seen are eternal. So Paul says he looks at the things you can't see. He doesn't look at the things you can see. <laughs> Why look at the things you can see? Because they can change. They, they can change. You know, a week's a long time in politics. Things can change quite rapidly. You know, famous celebrities can be disgraced tomorrow. The world can collapse. Your situation, well, think of Joseph. Um... You know, in prison. He woke up in the morning, he's in the prison. Uh, Life looks pretty gloomy. And by later that afternoon, uh, he's got a gold ring on. He's wearing expensive robes. And he's prime minister over one of the world's leading empires. Didn't look like it in the morning, right? So, you know, Paul's just making the point there for us, verse 18, that we don't look at the things which are seen. What's the point? But we look at the things which are not seen. The things which you can see are temporary. They're all subject to change. The things which are not seen are eternal. That's where to to look. And of course, God is eternal. His word, his promises are true. Irrespective of the fact we might be in times of trouble. So the psalmist in Psalm 91 said, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge. Now, did he say it to God? Did he say it to other people, his friends and colleagues? Did he just say it to himself? Well, we do know he said it. We do know he spoke it. And even if no other human being heard it, we certainly know that God would have heard it. The angels would have heard him say it. The demons would have heard him say it. And frankly, if all those folk heard it, that's good enough. And you might think, well, you know, I just, you know, I can't say things like that. I just, it's just not me. Not my personality, not my temperament. Uh, I just keep them quietly inside. I don't say any of that stuff. 
Well, the answer is that uh, probably if we recorded ourselves over the course of a few days or a week or two, we probably would find that we say a lot of things, very negative things. Oh, God, I don't believe you're going to help me through this one. Oh, God, where can I go for help here? Oh, God, I think I'm going to go under this time. All hope is gone. Well, if we say things like that, then we weren't aware that God's our protector or else we've forgotten that he's our refuge. Right, let's go back to Psalm 91 and we'll sort of finish there. Psalm 91. So again, I'll repeat, you know, Psalm 91 is a very encouraging psalm, but the protection is not automatic in the sense of you can't simply say, we can't simply say, well, I'm a Christian, so I get this protection. Well, I'm a church member. Well, I keep the Sabbath, therefore this should happen or I actually can't mean much because I know somebody who had a disaster and they were a Christian and therefore this psalm must just be mealy mouth platitudes that don't mean anything. And just another part of God's word, there is no power. Well, people, of course, come to that conclusion in many cases. But the psalmist here knew his place of refuge, didn't he? And uh, he believed he was going to be safe in that place of refuge. And he said it. So that appears to be the recipe. To know, to have the knowledge, to believe, and to speak out your belief confidently. That's what the psalmist did. So I guess if we want to enjoy the protection, we better... Follow the plan. I don't see it that way. I believe some of that stuff might be right. Although I'm not going to say any of it. Well, fine. In that case, we can't really claim the the psalm and uh, what it says if we don't sort of follow the, the guidelines. Anyway, let's pick up in Psalm 91, uh, verse um, 9 through 13. This again looks like it's the experienced... Um, teaching person talking to the uh, perhaps the younger less experienced verse 9 because you have made Jehovah who is my refuge even the most high your habitation where you live no evil shall befall you nor shall any plague come near your dwelling well that would be quite an interesting promise to have you know, if conditions uh, worsened in society and there was a breakdown of law and order and, uh, you know, around the events surrounding the tribulation period and there were diseases and epidemics, if you could say, well, verse 10 of Psalm 91 says, No evil shall befall me, nor shall any plague come near my dwelling. I'm going to take that and I'm going to stand on that. I'm going to run with that. I'm not going to look at what's seen on the latest news report because it's temporal and subject to change. But the word of God is settled forever in heaven. Verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. So what does that mean? So we're going to go to the zoo and find a sleeping lion and you know, take our shoes and socks off and walk up and down his back and massage it? Is that treading on a lion? Well, of course not. It's not talking of treading on a lion or a, or a serpent. For that matter, there's no real benefit in doing that. That would be sort of a rather provocative. But of course, there is a lion who affects you and me in the sense of, you know, our enemy, the devil, is a roaring lion, is as a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. And you and I want to be on top of the devil, right? Trample the devil underfoot. Trample, it says, uh, the cobra, the serpent. Well, we're not going to turn there for, for time reasons, but uh, if you looked at Luke 
chapter 10, verse 18. If you turn there, don't. I haven't got time, but if we turn to Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus was giving his disciples instructions, and he said he was giving them authority to, quote, trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Authority to trample on or tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And, of course, our enemy is the devil, like a roaring lion. So, you know, verses 9 through 13 here in Psalms 91, it has the picture of protection from plagues, uh, angelic protection. And it even says that you and I have authority to tread upon demons and uh, Satan's minions, the cobras, the serpents, the lions. You know, we're the ones in charge. We're the ones in ascendancy. We're the ones who can cast out demons, right? Not vice versa. We should have no fear of the spirit realm. Dropping down to verses 14 through 16. And here's a change of party. Up till now, we've had the experienced uh, teacher uh, giving advice, if you like, to the uh, to the student and uh, talking about the promises available. Here in verse 14, we get God entering the picture. This is a psalm which is God speaking to the you know, to the audience. Uh, and now God says what he will do to this person who's learned to abide uh, in his secret place. Verse 14 through 16. Because he has set his love upon me, capital M, therefore, says God, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. All right? So here's God speaking. And God, if you like, is endorsing, you know, firsthand here, God is endorsing the protection. But notice a couple of the caveats. Because he set his love upon me, therefore I'll deliver him. So the student or the man or woman of Psalm 91 is somebody who sets their love on God. You said, seek my face, Lord, I'm seeking your face. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments, amongst other things. I will set him on high, verse 14, because he has known my name. Well, I think familiar with God. Good relationship with God. Verse 15, God says, he shall call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. We don't always escape immediately. I'll be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. And then verse 16, with long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. With long life, the margin says, with length of days. It is talking about, you know, life, years of life. And God says here, this is God speaking, with long life, with a long life, I will satisfy him. What does that mean? Well, It means you live as long as it takes for you to be satisfied. It's what you're entitled to. It's not three score years and ten or at a push four score. It's a long life until you are satisfied. Who decides whether you're satisfied? Well, you do. Right? Uh, Barnes' commentary. Barnes is one of the old classic commentaries. uh, Talking of this verse here says, uh, quotes, The meaning is, I will give him length of days as he desires or until he is satisfied with life, end quote. So, if we're not satisfied, I guess we ask for more. And it's implied, of course, that at some point in our lives we will actually be satisfied and think, you know what, yeah, I'm okay now. I've I've done what I want to do, I've seen what I want to see, I'm done. But until that point, if we're not satisfied, we, it's implied here, should ask for more. So that's Psalms 91. It's, I think, a very encouraging psalm with protection in it, with blessing in it, with long life in it. I heard this week uh, a lady who apparently read Psalm 91 out loud, I think, several times a day. And a story, if I got it right, was I think her husband had stopped by a car crash to to offer help as a good Samaritan and he got out of his car and got 
sort of rammed by some driver behind. I uh, was in hospital for, I think, quite a while. Uh, you know, breaks all over the place. I think he had something like 27 units of blood. Yep. That's about three times your entire blood supply <laughs> through transfusions. And anyway, long story short, uh, his wife uh, was believing for his complete restoration and healing, even though he'd been written off by the doctor. Uh, and apparently she read this psalm out loud um, every single day just to encourage her and to lift her spirits and to remind her God is protector. So I think we can see why it's a very well-liked psalm. But for you and me, it does no good unless we believe it and receive it. Um, and like most things which are spiritual, we need to renew our minds by spending you know, good quality time in God's word. So that God and his word are as real to us as they were to the psalmist. Uh, remember, remember last week, we talked about how uh, U.S. adults, the average amount of time they spend watching TV is five hours and four minutes a day. Over five hours a day, average, sums more than that. And then by comparison, churchgoers, generally speaking, churchgoers, only, well, a bit less than one in five read their Bibles every day and typically between five and 30 minutes. Well, what, is that renewing your mind? When four out of five churchgoers don't read the Bible daily, and those who do is five minutes, 20 minutes, or five hours in the TV? Come on. You know, where are their minds dwelling? So I'll just conclude by saying, uh, how are we doing? How are you doing? Uh, obviously, the advice to you and to me is dwell in the secret place of Jehovah, speak out our faith and confidence in him, and then accept his protection and the offer of a long and satisfying life. Okay, with that, we'll conclude today's Bible study.